Well, Shabbat Shalom. I think we're ready to begin today. Good morning and welcome. This week's Parsha readings. Hot mic. Bahar the Chuotai comes from Leviticus chapter 25 and 27, the last chapters in the book of Leviticus. This Torah portion this week begins with God listing out all that he will do for his people who follow his commands. On Sinai, God communicates to Moses the laws of the sabbatical year. Every seventh year, all work on the land should cease, and its produce becomes free for the taking for all, man and beast. Seven sabbatical cycles are followed by a 50th year, the Jubilee year, on which work on the land ceases. All indentured servants are set free. All central estates in the Holy Land that have been sold revert back to their original owners. And this Torah portion describes the favor that will follow the one who obeys God's commandments and the richness that they will experience. It also describes what will happen if they don't. This Torah portion spends more time describing the curses that will fall on someone who chooses not to follow and listen to God's ways. But every time the Torah states that a person who chooses not to follow will be given a chance to turn around and to do good. The curses will only increase and multiply if one continues not to listen. The half Torah portion comes from portions of Jeremiah 16. And what we read here is Jeremiah's response to God's faithfulness. For God just say that he is over his people and keeps his eyes upon them, and that he will regather them from the nations upon which they have scattered. Jeremiah then goes on to tell of the sinful ways of the people and what will happen to them because of their disobedience. These words of Jeremiah's response are very heartfelt and offer up encouragement for those who read it. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. Amen. The Brich Hadashah comes from the writings of Paul in Galatians and again deals with the concept of slavery and that of restoration only from a different perspective. Paul, like in most of his writings, is dealing with the battle between the spirit and the flesh. Paul is trying to persuade his readers to understand the trappings of fleshly desires and the reward for those who seek such actions, and that is death. He says, Understand then that those who have faith are children of Avraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Avraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Avraham, the man of faith. And those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, who choose evil. But those who live by the Spirit are set free from the law of sin and are restored to the right standing with God. So if we walk by the Spirit, God's blessings will surely pour into our hearts and in our minds. And we shall enjoy a full and fruitful life. Even today on this very Shabbat, there is more fullness of God that we can experience if we are willing to relent from our desires of our flesh and accept and want his desires. If we lay down our burdens and if we ask for his guidance, his word promises that we shall experience the helping hand of God. We are to stand firm in the freedom that we have received from Yeshua and not burden ourselves again with the yoke of the slavery of sin. In this week's Psalms readings, comes from Psalms 112. It says, Praise the Lord. How blessed is the one who obeys the Lord, who takes great delight in keeping in his commands. His descendants will be powerful on the earth. The godly will be blessed. His house contains wealth and riches. His integrity endures. In the darkness, a light shines for the godly, for each one who is merciful and compassionate and just. It goes well for the one who generously lends money, and conducts his business honestly, for he will never be upended. Others will always remember one who is just. He does not fear bad news. He is confident. He trusts in the Lord. His resolve is firm. He will not succumb to fear before he looks in triumph on his enemies. He generously gives to the needy. His integrity endures. He will be vindicated and honored. When the wicked see this, they will worry. They will grind their teeth in frustration and melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Amen. Shofari.
praise you, praise you, praise you, Yeshua. Heavenly Father, I pray that you're, you would look down upon us, Father, on this people, Lord, and that you would see a people that are obedient, Father, and that are listening. Lord, I pray that you would turn your ear towards us this morning, that you would hear us when we're praising and worshiping you, that you would see our hearts, Lord God, and, and see how much we love you. Heavenly Father, I pray, Father, this morning for your anointing to fall in this place. I pray for every need to be met this morning. I thank you, Lord God, that you forgive us of all of our sins and that we are pure in your eyes. Heavenly Father, I prayed this morning for those that can't be with us because they're sick. I ask you, Lord God, to pour out your anointing of healing upon them that you would touch those, Lord God, that have been put on the prayer chain this morning, and that you would meet every need. And Lord, those that are, that are sick this morning, Lord, I just thank you that your anointing is with them right now, and you're touching their bodies right now. In Yeshua's name, I know that you have given us names, Lord God, of people that need touched. I thank you, Lord God, that you have given your, your command, Lord God, your command to heal these people, this little child, Landon, Lord. I pray right now for him. Father, he needs touched. He needs touched, Lord. In Yeshua's name, in Yeshua's name, touch him, Jesus. Touch his mother, Lord. Give her a great faith, Lord, to believe that you're there and you're going to heal him. Lord, this is a season of planting, Lord, and I know there's many people that have been planting seeds, Lord, in people's hearts this week. I pray, Lord God, that those seeds would grow. I thank you for the opportunities that you're giving all of us, Lord, to be witnesses for you. And how you've given us that mandate, Lord, that we are to go out and share the gospel. So, Lord, let those seeds just grow into great trees, Father. Let them be watered. And, Lord, as the word comes forth this morning, I pray for your anointing upon the word, Lord. I ask, Lord God, that it would feed our souls and our spirits and our minds. I pray, Lord God, in the name of Yeshua, that we would sing praises unto you that would sound glorious to you. Have your way in this service. Touch every single person. Touch Denny's nerve in his hand, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would heal that nerve. I thank you, Lord God, that you are more than able. You are the great physician, Lord God. So touch him today, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's holy, holy name. We thank you and praise you for everything you're going to do this morning. In Yeshua's name, amen. Let us stand together. For how lovely are the tents of Jacob in the dwelling places of Israel. So Shaft in my imbesses, some imane, I yes, you are. Shaft in my im, yes. My, 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 
Oh my bestest, oh my 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 my, oh my bestest song. Hey, hey. Oh my 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 bestest song, my. Oh my 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 bestest song, shaft in my bestest song, me money, yes you are, shaft in my bestest song, me money, yes you are, my 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 my. Oh my best is so my 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 Oh my best is some Hey Hey Oh my 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 best is so my Oh my 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 best is so Therefore with joy we shall draw water from the wells of salvation Amen amen You may be seated All right, Shabbat Shalom. All right, we begin this door with the Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvarach, Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vayed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to, a, new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Blessing Mashiach Yeshua together. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu, et derech hayeshua, b'mashiach Yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation, Messiah Yeshua. Amen. We all stand for the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Vahafta et Adonai Lohecha, Bokolavavko, Kodnashakav, Komodakam. Vahayu Hadrim Haele, as share Anakim et Afkayom, Allah Vavakam. Vashina Talavenak with the Bartabam, Beshivka Bevetakam, Uvlatka Vaderak, Ushapko Ukumekam, Ukshar Tom Leota Edekam. Violet of Ben and Neka, Uta Tama Zot Beteka, Uvisharaka. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The hafta, the riacha, kamoka, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Yitzchak, and God of Yaakov. The great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, God who bestows grace and creates all. 
and remembers the kindnesses of the fathers and bring, brings Redeemer to the children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield, blessed are you, O Lord, Shield of Abraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord, the resurrector of the dead are you, abundantly able to save, who sustains the living with kindness, resurrects the dead with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those asleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? Our God and God of our fathers, may you be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us in your commandments and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy us from your goodness and make us rejoice in your salvation. And purify our hearts to serve you in truth. In love and favor, O Lord our God, grant us your holy Shabbat as a heritage in May Israel, who sanctifies your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, Mekadesh HaShabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon. And all say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he, though he be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and all say, Amen. May he who makes peace in his high places make peace upon us, upon all Israel, and say, Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Oh, say shalom bimramah, who yase shalom aleinu, ve'acho Yisrael, v'imru, imru, amen. Oh, say shalom bimramah, Say shalom aleinu ve'acho Yisrael v'imru imru amen. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu ve'acho Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yacho Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yacho Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom. Shalom Aleinu, Yacho Yisrael. May he who makes peace in high places make peace for Israel and for all mankind and say, Amen. Uh
Oh, miss. Start. <laughs> oh, wonder and awe surround you, Lord. Oh, glory and fire like the way. And day after day, the heavens proclaim.
great strength to face the day and in your presence. Oh, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. praise you God we do welcome you here into this place father we ask that your glory would fall and that you would receive our praises today God hallelujah praise you he is a faithful father Calling us out of the dark. Night cannot whisper away what he said in the light. He is our firm foundation. Our anger won't be moved. Storms may collide, but our souls are fire in his word. Oh, we listen to the sound of the power. Broken the curse, he has never lost a battle. Who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? Yeshua defeat in the darkness, he has never lost a battle. strong high tower fear will not find me there for I come alive with his promise inside of me yes oh we listen to the sound of the power on our lips Yeshua broke in the curse he has never lost a battle and who Yeshua defeat in the darkness, he has never lost a battle. And when listen to the sound of the power on our lips, Yeshua has broken the curse, he has never lost a battle. Who are you, great mountain, that you should not follow? Yeshua defeat in the darkness. He has never lost a battle. My Redeemer, we remember you have won the war. Yeshua the mighty overcomer, our defender and conqueror. My Redeemer, we remember you have won the war. Yeshua the mighty sound 
of the power on our lips. Yeshua, the broken, the curse, he had never lost a battle. Who are you, great mountain, that you should not be moved? Yeshua, to feed him the darkness, he has never lost a battle. to our worship. Yeshua, he never loses all. Who are you? Oh, mountains move. Oh, Be 
closer to you. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see your glory. Your glory, Lord. Open our ears. We want to be closer and closer to you. Praise you, our King. Praise you, our God. God, we seek you right now. Father, we hunger and thirst for more of you. Lord, the more we receive of you, the more we fall in love with you, and the more desperate we become for you. And God, we just ask that as we worship you as we bless you, Father God, that you would receive our praises, that you would inhabit our praises, O God. Today our desire is to please you, to make you happy. Father, thank you for this day that you have made. Thank you that we can come into your house and worship you. Thank you that we can come and rest at your feet. Open our eyes today to see all of you. Open our ears to hear your voice of truth speak mightily today from your throne room. We just love you so much, God, and we praise you for who you are. Thank you, Father, for your spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Yeshua, Father, who died on the cross for our sins and made a, a way back to you. You are so precious to us, and we just surrender ourselves to you today. In Yeshua's name we pray. Vahi ben Sawa Aharon. When the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Yamod Yuel, 
ben Avraham la Torah. Barku et Adonai Hamvarach. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach, Leolam Vayed. Baruch et Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher Bakar Binu Mikol Ahamin. Vinatan Lanu et Torato. Baruch et Adonai Notain Ha Torah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Yiladim. Let us pray. Thank you, O Lord, for these blessed children and the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that a hedge of protection be placed around each and every one of them, keeping them safe, keeping them from harm's way. Lord, as they grow physically, Lord, spiritually, we ask that they're drawn near to you. They realize who you are, Yeshua, and they receive you as their Messiah. Lord, I also ask that you would surround them with godly men and women who will assist them on their life's journey. They're such blessings to us, O oh Lord. We thank you for them, O oh Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Ve de ber Adonai el Moshe, bahar Sinai le mor, de ber el bene Israel, ve mart alehem ki tavau, el haaretz asher ani noten lechem, ve shavta haaretz shabbat la Adonai, shesh shanim tazria sedecha, ve shesh shanim tizmor karmecha, ve saft et tevuata. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow the field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. Amen. Amen. And it's, uh, it's hard to believe that we've already come to this point of the Torah, but we are finishing the book of Leviticus. And we've gone to the uh, fourth book already, Babid Bar Numbers. And so all together we say, Chazad, Chazad, Benit, Chazek, be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. Amen, amen. Baruch Atzad Onai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu Toret Imet, Vachaye Olam Nata Bechotenu, Baruch Atzad Adonai Notain HaTorah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Vizot ha Torah, asher sam Moshe lifnei b'nei Yisrael, al pi Adonai biad Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the, at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God, and Yeshua is this Word. John the Immersion said in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's word is written on lamb's skin, and Yeshua is this lamb. In John 12, 32, Yeshua said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitzchaim, or Tree of Life. And Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Eitzchaim hi lamacha zikimbar. Vetom kehar mushar darkehar darke noam vechol nativa teha shalom hashavenu adonai alecha vineshuva kakadesh yemenu kakadem 
It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregation. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, he is, and he shall ever be. This word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat Shalom. Happy Mother's Day weekend. Um, back in 2019, I never really shared this with anybody, but I felt really, uh, I kept feeling like something dreadful was going to occur. You know, I couldn't get over the feeling. It was overwhelming. And uh, even to the point where there were times that, you know, like, I felt the same way like when I had a, a panic attack, like I've had panic attacks in the past and dealt, deal with anxiety, mostly because of my personality. Uh, I'm, I'm prone to it because I'm a type A and my mind goes 300 miles an hour. So I create panic in my own head. But I remember in 2019, I, uh, I just had this immense feeling, this overwhelming feeling of, of dread, like something was going to happen, something terrible. Um, and then 2020 came, and I thought, well, this is it. And I told my wife, we were laying there in March of 2020 in our bed watching the television and watching everything close down and hearing what they were saying. And I told her, I remember like it was yesterday, plain as day, that we will never be the same again. We will never be the same again. And she said, what do you mean? I said, everything's different. It all changed right now, it shifted. Everything's different, I know it. And I felt that was what I was feeling, like this shift. And I wasn't sure what that shift was. Um, you know, it, it was definitely a spiritual experience. I was definitely going through a spiritual experience. And if you, if you live your life in the context of, you know, you want to follow God, you want to keep his commandments, you want to honor him in your life, and you do your best to do that. And, you know, at the same time, you're still battling in the flesh because you're physically here. Okay, you're not spiritually you're not only spiritually walking about, okay? You're also walking about in the flesh. And so you're battling that on a daily basis, that's, and that's scriptural, okay? That's very, it's very scriptural. We know that. So you, you think to yourself, all right, I'm here in this, this I'm feeling this way spiritually, but, but I feel like what I'm feeling in the spirit is going to happen in the flesh. I feel like there's something that's going to physically change the world is going to physically change. Some, some sort of disaster is afoot. And so we get there, 2020, I tell Tasha, I said, look, we're never going to be the same. The world is never going to be the same. Everything changes from here on out. Everything's different. And, and I felt still very glo gloomy, okay, very, you know, I wasn't as positive as others were. I mean, there were people out there just screaming and yelling about how great things were going to be. And even now, I mean, if you watch things, they're thinking that the world is in this great shift. Um, and we're shifting towards something even greater than we've ever experienced. 
Um, and, and I don't necessarily, uh, you know, follow suit with that, right? I'm, I'm not falling into that camp. I'm not falling into the camp that everything's going to hell in the handbasket either. Because everything's going exactly where God wants it to go. The difference is understanding what God wants and what you want. Understanding the purpose that God is trying to create around you versus the purpose that you desire in your own life. Now, I think that when we feel things in the spiritual, a lot of times we're not feeling them for ourselves, per se. We could be feeling them for um, the, the body, the total body. And I think that, you know, that's what I've been feeling for, for months and years. And I've been experiencing for years this, this groan, groaning and hurry up, bud, get back there. What are you doing? Get going. Run. Um, we've been experiencing this groaning and and I think it's for the whole body. I don't think it's just for me, but I think God puts us, you know, when we are seeking his face, he'll put us in positions where we actually are feeling the transition that he's trying to create. And I sit here and I think about um, the, last, the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking about war, being, you know, warriors battle. And there's... There's a song that I I was listening to about how the battle is already won. And sometimes when you go against a, a, an army or force, a great force, you, you look at it and you say, okay, well, this great force right here has already won the battle. They're going to go against this force, but this great force has already won the battle because you can predict it just by, by the sheer mass and, and, and volume of ability that this this force has you're just saying to yourself the battle's already won but it's interesting because it doesn't stop the warriors in the battle from getting dressed for battle even though they've won the war they still get dressed for battle they still put on their armor now imagine not our current military situation okay but imagine Back in the day when they had, uh, you know, breastplates and they had helmets and they had swords and shields and spears, picture this in your own head and say to yourself, these are warriors. I mean, and you picture warriors that way. When I think of a warrior, I don't picture a guy in a, in a camouflage uniform. If someone says warrior to me, I immediately picture a gladiator. Okay, I don't think of a guy in military camouflage, you know, and, and a duty belt, you know, that's that's going to go to that's going to go to war. Um, maybe you know you can picture a Navy SEAL who's all decked out in his gear and his weapons and stuff, but but I never do that. I never picture that. I always picture a shield and a sword and a breastplate and a helmet when I think of a warrior. And when I think to myself and I tell myself, you need to wake up and be a warrior today, I don't picture myself with my, a my AR and, and, and my pistol. I picture myself with a sword and a shield. And so I, I, say, I come to this place where I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this battle. And yes, there's a battle in the spirit that's huge right now. It's going on. It's been going on for years. And it's still here, but the battle is won, but that doesn't mean that we don't get dressed for it. So we think to ourselves, okay, the battle's won, God's got this. Well, you realize you're part of that army. You're in that army. So when God says we're going out to war, prepare for war, you have to prepare and get dressed for battle. You can't wait and sit back and think to yourself, 
oh, God's got this. You put your armor on. And you go to war. It doesn't matter if you're going to use your weapon or not. You have to stand up and get in line and get ready. I was telling the kids we were practicing a couple weeks ago on a Friday night. They were you're going to do a song. They're going to sing with us at Shavuot. And they're acting very timid in the mics, and they're, they're kind of standoffish, and they're kind of backed off. And I said to them, unsheath your swords. Unsheath your sword. So there's a, there's a guy that I listen to. Um, I won't share his name, but there's a guy I listen to, and he talks about a scripture in the Bible. The scripture specifically, that the meek shall inherit the earth. And I asked the kids, do you guys know what it means when, it, when the scripture said, the meek shall inherit the earth? What does that mean? What do you picture when I say that? And each one of them said, well, you know, somebody who's humble and kind of low, head low and, you know, kind of wearing sandals. You know, like, you know, you picture an ancient meek person, okay, someone who's soft-spoken, kind of, you know, uh, you know, maybe taking a vow, okay, some sort of priest of some sort, a monk, you picture that as being the ones that inherit the earth. The interpretation that this guy affords, which, which I think is a very good one, when he, when he takes that word meek, he, 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 he interprets it differently. And I haven't gone and looked at the interpretation or looked at the actual word in, in its entirety, and maybe I should, but I'm going to share his interpretation because I thought it was good. He said the word meek doesn't mean lowly, humble, weak, weak. What meek is is a, is a warrior who's wearing his armor and his sword is sheathed and he stands in front of conflict and he's able to make a decision without unsheathing his sword. And he's one who brings grace to a conflict. That's the meek. It's not someone who's lowly and walking and weak. This is a strong man who's able to discern the circumstances and without taking out his sword to move the masses, he moves the masses with grace. Because historically, leaders in the world use swords and warfare to control people. He's saying that the meek will use grace and peace, but yet have an established stronghold of, of strength that people see. And they'll inherit the earth. And I thought to myself, that's beautiful, but there's a day when the meek are going to be told to unsheath your sword. It's time for battle against the real enemy. The real enemy is in the spirit. The real enemy is not in the flesh. The real enemy is in the spirit. And so when we go to war, there are times we have to unsheath our sword. And what is our sword? It's the word of God. You fight the battle with the word. Yeshua was in the wilderness and he was fasting, and he was being tempted by every temptation you could know to man. And what was going on? Yeshua was speaking back the word. He was using the word to defeat the enemy, even though the enemy was coming at him very strong and was, and was enticing him and telling him he was going to give him everything. You're hungry. Take this stone and turn it into bread. You're the son of God. You can do that. You can just make it happen. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm going to use the word of God to defeat you when you tell me those things. Why? Because I'm on a mission. And you're interfering with my mission by trying to tell me to stop my mission, my purpose 
The moment Yeshua would have turned that stone into bread, he would have, he would have lost his mission. His mission would have failed. God would have had to use another. Look at all these kingdoms. I'll give them to you. I'll give them to all of you. I'll give all these kingdoms to you if you just bow to me, worship me. Can't have any other gods. I have no other gods before me. We have gods in our lives that God is trying to destroy, idols that God is trying to destroy in our lives. We may not recognize those idols. We don't recognize them because we normalize them. They're normal to us. The way we think, our minds, the way we see things, the way we view the world isn't in the spiritual, but it's in the physical. Those idols have to be destroyed so that God can raise you up. The question is, what does it mean for God to raise you up? Immediately when you think to yourself, God, raise me up, what are you envisioning? You're envisioning things that are in the physical. God, make my name great among other people. The Word of God says that he will make your name great. Whose name is he making great? What people are he, is, is he making great their names? What, pe what kind of people? Probably not the ones that are asking for it. Probably not the people that are asking for them to make his name great. Lord, make my name great. Well, you're probably on the wrong path already if you're asking for it. The humble, the meek, the soldier that's waiting to be called on, sitting there waiting, his sole purpose, his sole purpose is to, is to serve the king. His sole purpose is to be the warrior for the king. His sole purpose in life is to do what the king bids. That's the person that God will call upon, and you have to be prepared to be called upon. You have to have your armor on every day. You have to wake up. You have to put it on. You put your breastplate on. You put your helmet on. You pick up your shield and your sword, and you stand there at attention, and you wait to be called upon. The British troops that stand outside of Buckingham Palace. They're not fighting, they're not at war, but they're standing guard, waiting, waiting for something to happen. Most of the time, the things that happen are some guy standing in front of them, making fun of them, talking to them, trying to get them to move and laugh, trying to get them to do things, taunt them. Do you ever feel taunted by the enemy? Standing there in wait standing there and waiting for God to call upon you. The enemy is taunting you. The enemy is telling you what you should or shouldn't be, what you should say, how you should move, touching you and prodding you and poking you and putting you into situations that are making you feel uncomfortable, but you have to wear your armor, and that armor happens in the mind. We have to overcome. The world around us is getting worse. Things are bad. I don't know what the leaders of the world are going to do, okay? Because they're all together, by the way. I mean, love one or the other. They're all the same. They're all the same. They all have an agenda. There's only one agenda that matters, and it's God's. It's not his or theirs or ours or where we sit in life or what we want or how we want our life to be perceived or what we want to get out of life. It's what God wants for us and for the world. And ultimately, God wants to redeem us. In order to be redeemed, you have to be in a situation to be redeemed from. Okay, redeeming, you don't redeem someone out of perfection. You don't redeem someone out of peace. You redeem them from war. 
So we are going to naturally be at war. We are going to naturally be suffering. We're going to naturally be in a place mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually where we need to cry out to God. And the problem is, is that people get comfortable and they stop crying out to God. And I'll argue there was a four-year period 2020 that all of the Christian world thought that the world was a great place. We were all doing well. Everything was great. The world was was awesome and the, you know, look what our country was doing and what we were building and creating and all these great things that were happening around us. We forgot that we were in disarray. 2019 before things went to hell in a handbasket, I had a feeling uh, that things were bad even though they were good. Things aren't good. Something's wrong. Something bad's going to happen. This isn't good. Someone will probably look at you and think you're crazy, man. You're, in, you know, you're losing your mind. But my spirit was feeling something else, and 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 I can look back on it and say that that's clearly what what it was feeling. But but my spirit now is feeling like it's time to arm up. It's time to prepare for battle. It's the it's the dark times that we prepare. The good times you forget, right? You forget to prepare in the good times and you get, become weak. But you get your mind right in the dark times and understand that those things can always happen. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We have a strong God who can overcome every battle and every circumstance. And if we look at life in the spiritual and realize that he's got a plan and that we are his chess pieces. He's not made for us. We're made for him. The Sabbath was made for us. But we were made for him. This is a different way of looking at life. If you're made for him and you put yourself in a position where you say to yourself, Lord, whatever it is that you desire, I desire. Your life changes, your mind changes, your eyes change. What you see changes. It's, it's a completely different way of looking at life. Bad things will happen. They're not bad. They're meant. He meant it for something, okay? That's not what weak people do, to be frank. There was a guy a long time ago, Jesse Ventura, who was a politician and a wrestler. He, he's famous for a quote. The quote was, Christianity is a crutch for weak-minded people. His belief is that Christianity is a crutch for weak-minded people. I'd argue that it takes a very strong-minded person to believe in an invisible God that is in control of all things that are around us, including the air, the wind, the earth, the birth of trees and people and all these things. It's a strong-minded person to believe in something that's intangible, which is separate from what science would prove. We have to have a strong mind to believe in what is not necessarily provable but that's why blessed are those who believe and have not seen we don't see with our eyes we see with our faith and our belief and through our faith and belief we realize 
God's truth that God is real through the miracles he performs. My belief in, in, in the strength and the might of God is that I think, I believe, we're about to see an outpouring of miracles. I feel like, put your armor on, because you're about to witness a battle of miraculous proportions in this world. I'm going to remember I said this to you, just like I remembered it in 2019, what I felt. But you're going to view it, this small little group, you're going to realize it in your own lives, but not only in your own lives, on the global stage. We're going to see miraculous things happen. God is about to move in a miraculous way. And it could be, it could be so biblical that it's scary to us, that we are afraid of it. For instance, I see people online all the time talking about their experience, how they saw Yeshua in person, you know, in a vision or a dream or, or, or an event, or they died and went to heaven and came back, and all these experiences that people have. And they act like it was like they wanted it. They were crying out for it. I'm afraid to see Yeshua in person right now. Like, I'm fearful of that. I'll get deep in prayer, and I'll feel this presence that's so great. I'll even say, Lord, don't. I'm getting freaked out right now. Like, I'll feel it. I'm not one of those people that feels like, I'm going to run into the arms of Daddy. I mean, this is what they say. They call Yeshua Daddy. There's songs that call him Daddy. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Okay, I think it's great. My relationship with Yeshua is one of fear and trembling. I can't explain why. I don't know why I feel that way, but it's one of fear and trembling. It's also one of, I know who I serve. I'm humbled in his presence in a different way. It's like whenever you have, you know, there's people that, you know, let's say you grow up with your, with your fathers, you know, and say there's a lot of the different kids, there's different kids, so I have five kids. Maybe when we get older, when they get older, one of them is say, I always felt I felt like it was easy to talk to dad. I could go to dad with anything and talk to him. But others would say, you know, I had a hard time doing that, you know. Like my sister Jennifer used to always come to me to go to dad. She'd be like, hey, will you ask dad? I'm like, why would I ask dad? You go ask dad. Well, you, you, talk, you, you, have, you could talk to him better than I can. Why? It's a relationship in the mind of one of fear and respect versus one of, you know, he's my homeboy, we rub elbows, and I can talk to him about anything I want. You know, like, it, it's a different feeling, and I, and I have a feeling when I get into God's presence, I'd love to see the things in the physical, right? I, I think that I would like it, but I also I also have a, a sense of immediately I'm down on my face. And I remember when I saw God in Israel in my dream. I physically saw him. And when I woke up, I couldn't raise my face because I felt his presence in the room still. I couldn't raise my face. I refused to raise my face. And I had to pee so bad <laughs> I had to. I needed to get up and go to the bathroom, and I, I was not getting up and going to the bathroom. And I was even telling myself, "I'm gonna go right here. It's a hotel. They'll clean it up." Like, and then my my sister wakes up and she's like, "What's wrong, Mikey?" Because she hears me. I'm like, "I just saw God." She's like, "That's good. Go back to sleep." It's a different way of thinking about it, but I'll tell you, I'm feeling that feeling of we're about to feel an, an outrageous shift in the miraculous. 
And I don't know if you guys feel it or not, but I think it's time that you, that you get into some prayer, if not. Put on the full armor of God, verse 11, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Do you think they knew something then that we don't know now? That our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers? Rulers? Powers? and world forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. What rulers are in heavenly places? What powers are in heavenly places? What wickedness is in heavenly places? We don't see with spiritual eyes, we see with physical eyes. We don't realize that every bad thing that happens to us is not necessarily, you know, it's not, it's not from God. God's not doing it, right? There's a, there's a sense of reward and punishment that comes as a result of following God's commands. But there also is a sense of following God's commands and the evil one will attack you. You're his enemy. You are, you, are, you are going to be attacked. And if you're not being attacked, good question. If you don't daily have to pull up your faith shield because something's going on, arrows are coming at you daily, then, then what's the point in God? If your life is good, what's the point in God? You don't need God. That's why it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go into the gates of heaven. Your wealth, your riches make things easy. It's true. It's true. It's hard when... You know, like for, we, we just, T Tasha and I, you know, we're crunching our lives and, you know, changing things a bit. Her car completely collapsed, done, went on the fritz last week, last Shabbat. We tried to start it. Nothing. Black. Blank screen. She got here, then it's gone. Dead. Completely gone. Same Two days later, my truck, gone. But let me tell you a little miracle. We were at my parents' house after Shabbat. We were having dinner. We decide to let Eliana drive around the parking lot. They go over, and the car's done. Tasha comes over to me, and she's like, it won't work. I'm like, probably needs, maybe it needs jumped. I'm like, that's weird. So I go over there, and it's not jumping. because It's got lights. It's just, a, it's just not working. The electrical system's completely dead. And I'm like, you know, furious inside. And we're trying to get it fixed. And I'm just complaining to God because it's like one thing after another. It's nonstop. And, you know, I'm going to have to spend thousands of dollars here. And I don't have thousands of dollars to spend. It's stuck here in the parking lot. I'm like, great, I need to get it moved. So my mom comes out, she sees, I'm very frustrated. Culmination of events happen. I get to a point where I'm totally frustrated. My shield of faith has to come up. And my mom comes out, she says, give me the keys, I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna try to start the car. I'm like, mom, you're not gonna get the car started. It's dead. Like, what are you going to do, Mom? Like, I can't get the car. You're not going to start the car. I'm just going to go over there and pray. I'm going to start the car. 
like whatever, here's the key. So my mom goes over there and this is no, I'm not kidding you. She walks down those steps and I said, God, I know, I know you're gonna start the car with her. <laughs> I didn't tell her that, but it's a fact. I said, I know that you're gonna do it. And okay. And all of a sudden, like I believed. I believed. I knew that she was going to get it started. Now, she didn't get it started. She just went over there, got in it, tried to start it, and nothing happened. Literally, nothing happened. It was black. She tried nothing. Like I suspected, then she sat in that truck, in that car, and prayed in tongues. And the engine started on its own. But there was nothing on the screens. The interior of that car was not on. The only thing that was on was the engine. And then I hear, me, 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 me. And I'm like, here we go. And I knew it. I literally knew it. I was sitting over there and I said, I, and when I heard her beeping, I'm like, yeah, well, I already knew you were going to do it. So I go over, I get in it. There's nothing. There's no screen. Okay. So I, I, you know, obviously the first position's reverse. So I put it in the first position and I take it and I get it to my house and I back it in so that I can get it towed to the, to the uh, dealership. I back it into the driveway and literally turn the car off and guess what? I tried to do it again, nothing. I tried the next day to do it again, nothing. I tried four or five times on Sunday, nothing. Monday, nothing. Just to get it to my house. God did that just to get it and then mom comes up to the porch and I was not in a talking mood and you know she says God did that for you Mikey so that you could see that he sees and I didn't tell her I already know I already know he told me you were going to get it started and I just don't want to tell you right now because it's irritating but it's a miracle it's a miracle God sees God knows, and he's in control. When we can rest in his providence, when we can rest in knowing that every step is necessary, every action, everything we receive, everything we put out is necessary, then God can start to really move in you. Everything you've done in life, everywhere you've been, every, every person you've met, every communication you've had, every problem, every good thing has been for his purpose. To develop, to grow, to, 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 to put you in a position that that warrior of his is going to be able to stand in that battle. He's preparing his army. He's preparing them with situations and circumstances of faith. So you better have a strong shield. It better not be weak. It better be made of molten iron and steel and wrapped in zinc and carbon fiber. It better be strong because we're, situ we're in situations in life where you're going to require faith. You better be ready with your sword. So what does that mean? It means you better read your word. You better know the scriptures to encourage you and to, to discourage the enemy who's coming at you. 
You better know the scriptures. If you're not reading the scriptures, if you're not asking him for your word, and it's not just hearing them, by the way. It's not just listening to people tell you the word. It's you studying it and you understanding it and you putting into perspective and you coming up with what God is using that scripture for so that when you come into situations in life, you're able to take the scriptures God gave you and use them in situations that matter. You know, you're going to listen to a lot of people tell you how script, you know, they'll call you up and say, you know, God is a great God and he's an awesome God. He's in control of all things. And, and these are the scriptures that he gave me for you. But well, you better find out what scriptures he's using in that circumstance for you too. The only way to do it is to read his word. We have to read it. My best time for reading the word is before bed. I get in bed and I read it. I'd much rather go to bed at night with that on my mind then go to bed at night with something else on my mind. And, and there's times I do go to bed with, you know, I've watched a movie or something before I or fell asleep to a movie, and, and it's the worst night. It's a bad night of sleep. And I'll wake up in the middle of the night, and I'll have to pull up the scriptures and read them because, because I can't sleep well. The battle's in the spirit. When you're asleep, you're in the spirit. So there's a fight that has to go on. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. What does it mean to stand firm? It means to stand in the face of your enemies without fear and with courage. To be strong and courageous. To chazak, chazak, venit, chazek. To be strong and strong and be strengthened. What does it mean to be strengthened? It means that God will take what is already strong and make it more, even more firm. The strong become stronger. And there's times you feel weak. You have to reflect upon why God has made you strong. Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. So, you have to stand in the truth and the knowledge of that God is real, that God is above all things. That, you know, just the truth itself says that I'm girding my waist about knowing that God is in control of all things. So that I can go into this battle knowing that he's in front of me, behind me, and all around me. That is the truth. The truth is that he came, he died, he rose, and he's coming again. And that I'm a part of his, of his army here. We know the truth and we're encouraged by the truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. He is our righteousness and we wear him around our chest. Can people see that on you? Do they see Yeshua on you is the question. I mean, there's times, you know, I go out and I'll get, you know, upset or angry and, I, and I'll, you know, do or say something that I regret because I don't want to be reflected that way. Did people see Yeshua on me in that circumstance? Do they know that we're different because we have Yeshua or do they know that we're different because there's something different about us? We can't, we've got to be known to be different because we have Yeshua, not because there's something different about us. And there's people out there that'll tell you, there's just something different about you. I've been told that my whole life. There's something different about you. And not all the time do I say, well, I believe that Yeshua is the Mashiach and, you know, I, I'm a faithful person. I mean, I, I say, oh, really? Okay, great. Thanks. You know, and I move on. You know, that's probably not necessarily the right thing to do. Maybe God's giving us an opportunity an opportunity to share the breastplate of righteousness shoes of peace it's hard to walk in peace it's that's like it's very difficult to have peace in your mind peace inside your spirit it's very hard 
even though we like to talk about it and we say that it's, oh, be at peace, God is in control. That's all a great thing to say. And I like to say to people when they tell me things like that, oh, easy for you to say, you know what I mean? Especially if you're in a good spot in life, you know? Because usually the people that are doing well are like, oh, God's got this. You'll be great. You know what I mean? Yeah, look where you're at, bud. Like, it's easy to say from your vantage point. But when things go to hell in a handbasket for the world, at what peace... What peace are you going to walk in? You have to come to a place where no matter what happens around you, no matter what distraction, no matter what scheme of the devil, no matter what arrow flies your way, you're walking on the path that you're on in perfect peace. Knowing and believing like last week, I was not at peace, and my mom was walking down the steps. The only thing that I was at peace to know was that God was going to start that car. I knew it inside my head. I, I knew God was going to start the car, and it was going to encourage my mother's faith. It didn't need to encourage mine because I already knew he was going to through her. I was at peace to know that was going to happen, but everything else was still storming inside of me. Okay, great. Thanks for starting a car. Thanks for letting me get home. But this, but that, but this. We have to be at peace in the whole situation. We have to be at peace with all of it. And that's hard. But it's necessary. And that's part of your military training. That's part of the development to be part of the army of God. You can't live a life without learning to be at peace. Yoav is mad because his, uh, some of these kids, whichever ones, will have to find out and spank them. But they unraveled his rope on his thing. It got all unraveled and it's all hanging there. Be at peace, my brother. But, but it's a good example, right? Even the littlest things, even the littlest things in our life could take peace from us. I'm standing back there. I recognize that he was upset about something during worship. And I'm just using you as an example because you're a child of Israel and we have to use us, right? The whole Bible's about it. We can get in a situation that can throw us completely off, completely off the ramp. We can't be off the ramp. We have to be at peace. Even the little things can take us into a state of war. Even the little things. But if we can focus on God and say, Lord, why are you doing this? What are you doing? And just stay focused. All the stuff around us are going to be all right. We're going to understand it. We're going to be able to, we're going to, be able to withstand it. The shield the spirit of the sword, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace. That shield of faith, it says to take it up, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Just that, that mere... F this doesn't say that you're going to be able to block them. It says that you're going to be able to extinguish them. That fire is gone. Faith controls what you allow in to your life. Faith controls, the level of your faith controls the level of the enemy that is in your life. And if the enemy is attacking you and you're allowing it to control you, it's because your faith is wavering. So now you have to say to yourself, okay, Lord, what do I got to do? Just have more faith. Okay, what does it mean to have more faith? I need to be in the Spirit. What does it mean to be in the Spirit? I have to get into the Word. I have to pray in the Spirit without ceasing. So pray in the Spirit. Okay, that's going to build my faith. How do we know that? Because 
Let's skip to verse 18. With every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit. Within this view, be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the saints and pray in by, pray in my behalf pray on my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known the boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am the ambassador in, in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak bodily, boldly as I ought to speak so here in Ephesians he's asking pray for me would you think that this that he would ask to pray for me, that I'd be bold. He's having fear to be bold. He's asking for prayer. Pray that I'm bold enough to say what I need to say, that I'm the ambassador of Christ. Pray for me that I have that boldness to say what I need to say, to be who I need to be in the time that I need to be it. That's the, sa that's the same thing we need to do. We need to ask God to give us the strength to be the person that we need to be in the time that we need to be it. Put on our armor. And not allow the enemy to steal from us. Joy, happiness, peace. Why? Because we serve a mighty, mighty God. It is God's intention that you do well, it is God's intention that you do abundantly well. But we have to put ourselves in a position where he's the one that takes us where we need to go. And we're not doing it. There's nothing that you can do in your life that's going to get you to where you think you want to be. I hear people all the time, they say, well, what's your goal? What's your What's your goal? What's your ambition? What's your dream? You know, I've never had a goal or a dream. I, I've, had a, I've had a drive. But if you think about my goals and my dreams and even, even yours, you may not even know what your goal or dream is. You know, some people have the dream to be an astronaut and they become it. Some have the dream to be a mechanic and they become a mechanic and have a, have a mechanic shop or they have the dream of this or that, you know. I dream to do, and, I, and I've come to a place where, you know, last week, where I want to wake up every single day in the purpose of God. Every day wake up in the purpose of God. And sometimes you're not doing the purpose of God when you wake up. You're just, you know, you just feel like you're, you're grinding Okay, you're going to work, you're doing your stuff. But that greater purpose that is out there that exists for you, are you every day in it? Sometimes it's just you have to do it. And I don't know what necessarily that purpose is for a lot of us, right? I don't know what that is, and I don't necessarily even know what the purpose is God wants for me. But it's his purpose for me, it's not my own. You have to be in the same position so what that means is when you're, not, when you're in a place where you don't know the purpose of God for your life, you wake up every morning and you put on the armor and you just get prepared. You prepare yourself to go wherever God has called you to go. Whatever battle he's called you to, you prepare yourself for that battle. You put on your armor and prepare yourself for battle. There's a story here in this I'm going to read this story to you guys. There's a wealthy businessman and his coachman. And you guys know what a coachman is? Someone who drives the cart, you know, has the horses. So you have a wealthy businessman and a coachman. And they, arrive, they arrive in a city on a Friday afternoon. After the rich man was settled the wealthy businessman. At the best hotel in town, the coachman went off to his humble lodgings, both washed and dressed for the Shabbat, and then set out for the synagogue for the evening prayers. 
On his way to the shul, the wealthy businessman came across a wagon, which was swerved off the road and was stuck in a ditch. Rushing to help a fellow in need, he climbed down into the ditch and began pushing and pulling at the wagon together with its hapless driver. But for all his good intentions, the businessman was hopeless out of it, hopelessly out of his depth. After struggling for an hour in the knee-deep mud, he succeeded only in ruining his best suit of Shabbat clothes and getting the wagon even more hopelessly embedded in the mud. And finally, he dragged his bruised and aching body to the synagogue, arriving a scant minute before the start of Shabbat. Meanwhile, the coachman arrived early to the synagogue and sat down to recite a few chapters of Psalms. And at the synagogue, he found a group of wandering paupers and being blessed with a most generous nature, he invited them all to share his meal. And when the synagogue sexton approached the paupers to arrange meal placements, the town's householders, as it was customary in Jewish communities, received the same reply from all of them. Thank you, but I have already been invited for the Shabbat meal. Unfortunately, however, the coachman's means were unequal to his generous heart, and his dozen guests left his table with but a shadow of a meal in their hungry stomachs. So we had a, a rich man helping a wagon trying to get out of the mud but got it further stuck, and we've got a poor man inviting a bunch of people to Shabbat meal, and he could hardly feed them. Thus the coachman, with his 20 years of experience in extracting wagons from mud holes, took it upon himself to feed a small army, while the wealthy businessman whose Shabbat meal leftovers could easily have fed every hungry man within a 10-mile radius floundered about in a ditch. Every soul said Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, in conclusion, is entrusted with a mission unique to him or her alone and is granted the specific aptitudes, talents, and resources necessary to excel in her ordained role. One, most, one must take care not to become one of those lost souls who wander through life trying their hand at every field of endeavor except for what is truly and inherently their own. The story propels today's message here. You can't believe that you're to go off into the world and try every little thing. You're, if you're a coachman, you're a coachman. If you're a wealthy businessman, you're a businessman. God has a deeper meaning. If we're in the commands of God, no matter what the state of our natural fate, whether we are rich or a pauper, we should always be tied into our purpose and thus realize the happiness that comes with fulfilling our true destiny. Unfortunately, we see the unique abilities and possessions of another and desire those rather than that we have been provided. The true blessing, the story goes to say, the true blessing that comes from keeping God's ways and mission and destiny in life as he called us, whether we are driving the rich man or the rich man himself, we've been given the tools required to realize happiness and embedded in our purpose by keeping the Torah, which is the tree of life, which is the eighth Chaim. The idea of this story is we, we daily wake up and we sometimes say, we sometimes are in the middle of doing something on that day that we're not meant to be doing. If we can eliminate that idea of, oh, I've got to go do this or I've got to go do that, know who we're supposed to be, be in God's purpose with what we have, our lives are going to change dramatically and we're going to walk in peace. The chaos that we have all around us is going to go away. We're going to be at complete, total peace. We have to have peace in our lives, walk with our feet shod with peace, have confidence and joy and faith in knowing God's in control and he's made you for a purpose. A specific purpose, one that has meaning, one that shares truth, one that goes to war. And there may be a day, I think, in the future where God shouts out and you hear him shout to you, unsheath your sword, and it's time to go to battle. 
He's been preparing you for something. He's been preparing all of us for something for the, for the last few years. And I think that that preparation is for the miracles that he's about to unleash upon the earth. Before the time and the end, we're going to see that. We're going to see the miracles of God occur. We're going to see God move in a miraculous way in almost biblical proportions. You're going to witness it and view it. Some of us will be trembling. Some of us will have fear but have peace to know that it's God. Some of us will run into the arms of their daddy. Some of us will be embracing it and saying this is what God wanted. But at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to find the peace. We have to get there. We have to accept what is, embrace what God's doing, and let him do the rest. I mean, it is the duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation, for he made us unlike the nations of the lands, has not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs, our lot like all their multitudes, and we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one blessed is he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation, the seat of his glory is in the heavens above, the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights, he's our God, there's none other. True is our king, there's nothing beside him as it is written in his Torah, you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord he is God in the heavens above, on the earth below, there is, amen. Amen, amen. Let us stand together. Let 
your light more shine in this wounded world, clean and pure, refined, so that we can more of yourself. to be Oh, you 
the air that we bring you our whole. All we need, Lord, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we lift up a song in worship. Oh, you're holy, Lord, you are holy. Oh, Oh, and wide 
Oh, Lord, we lay down on your altar. Oh, we lay it down, Lord. Um, burdens we lay down for you. Oh, won't you prepare us for your outpouring, Lord? For your presence, Lord, prepare our hearts, make us wide open to you. Oh, we lay down on the altar that which we have to give up. All our fears, all our doubts, all the things we hold to Instead of you, Lord, instead of you, we lay him down. We as one people, oh, we ask you to move and make us, make us holy to you. you come, won't you come and move, Lord? Oh, we love how you move, Lord. Holy unto you. Paris, Father. Forgive us, Lord. I can't shake this idea and thought that we're supposed to lay something down. I think the message today just provoked that. Just things that we seem are silly to give to God and the things that we seem are silly to pray for and for him to be a part of. We lay them down, man. It's our calling and it's our drive to be holy. What are we doing with that? We got two weeks until Shavuot. What are we doing? How are we preparing? Are we expecting God to move. Just another holiday. Another day. Could be. I think God wants something else. We can't shake that today. We can't stop. 
providing time for us to lay some things down, for some searching of our hearts, some trying of our faith today, to at least begin the prayer and the conversation with God to clean us up, the things, the things that are in us, the beliefs that are in us, the fears that are in us, to lay them down, and let God be God. Let his love come through us, and it may seem silly as a child, but that's what we're called to do is to love him and to believe and trust as a child. Children are silly. They have fun. They can find joy in the smallest things. How hard is that for us? Because of our worries, our doubts, our fears. So when we sing holy unto him, and God, holy unto you, help us as a body, help us as a people to shed the things that we need to shed, to let go of the things that need to be let go, of, to put to death the things that need to be put to death. It's through your hand, Father God, that you cause death, you allow it, you allow life, you breathe, you tear up, you bring down. There's no power in this world that you can't control and you have not put into place, Father God, and we trust and believe in that. That firm foundation, Father God, that you are all powerful. It's by your hand all things exist. So we sing, Father God, and do a work in us Please, Father, do a work in us. Prepare our hearts to be wide open for you on Shavuot, Father. One more time. us holy unto you, Lord, holy unto you, make us holy unto you, Sing with the angels today.
praise you, Father God. Lord, we worship you today. We worship you today, Lord. Nothing else matters in this moment except you. Only you, God, matter right now in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your presence that is here. Thank you for your sweet anointing that just rests over your people. We bless you today. We worship you. We say, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, God, for your word that came forth today. Thank you for your truth that sanctifies us, O oh God. Thank you for your love that redeems us. God, we pray that you would continue to do a good work in us and that each day, Father, we would put on that armor that you have given us, that we would walk out with a purpose for your glory and for your kingdom. Show us each day, Lord, how you want us to march forth. Give us our orders. And may we faithfully be obedient to those orders, oh God. We love you so much and we worship you today. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Blessings will come forth from the throne of God are what? Yeah. Nothing will what? Yeah. As we say together, Yevareka ka Adonai Garish Mareka, Yair Adonai Panava Leka Mibaneka, Isa Adonai Panava Leka Vesem Leka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his shalom. Shabbat shalom, 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 Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Even come quickly, Lord Yeshua. Amen and amen. Before we have the announcements, which Jason is going to do again this week, um, Ruben Senior Vaughn has something to say. We just want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. And we want you all to know we love you and we're so grateful for you. I mean, the world is trying to do with, away with the position of motherhood. We don't do that here. <laughs> Mothers are important to us, and we want you all to know how much we're blessed by you all, and we want you to have something. We want you to take a flower today home, um, and every time you look at it, try to keep it alive. <laughs> <laughs> and every time you look at it, just know that you're loved here. And um, there's a couple men here. Do you want me to take your wife home a flower? Do you want me to take your wife home a flower? Ben, take your wife home a flower. Um, if you're a mom, please come up and get a flower. Okay? Oh, Tina. Oh, no. Wait a minute. One other thing. Um, there's these little, uh, I think we should call them card holders, in the middle of the tables. And there's a little card on them. Shirley's been making the parashah reading and putting it in the middle of the uh, tables. Take the time to read it again. Um, she wasn't sure anybody even noticed it, but I want you to know. I want her to know that we all did notice it. Yeah. So just take the time to read them and maybe talk about it at own age. Not too many announcements. Stephen, this week's yeshiva. Kip. Um, Telpio. Youth group class. Vera will get a hold of you. <laughs> uh, Shavuot is, again, just under two weeks away. Uh, plan on that. And then any other announcements that we need to make for today? All right. Let's go eat. Uh, blessing together, we say Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMot Silech HaMin Haretz, B'Shem Yishu Mashiach, Amen, Amen. Shavu Tov.